Okay, we can finish it. <clears throat> so what is that theta? And what is sine of theta? Sine is the ratio of the opposite side over the hypotenuse. But theta is also the length of this arc between point 0.1 and point 0.2 divided by r. That's what theta is in radians. If you measure the arc, like if you measure a whole circumference and divide by the radius, you get 2 pi radians. That's why physicists love radians. That's what they're for. If I have part of an arc and I just divide by r, well, if my arc is really, really small, so small, in fact, that I can't tell if it's round or if it's flat, and you think, wait a minute, that's preposterous. When are distances so small you can't tell if they're straight or round? Oh, yeah. Is the floor in this room straight and flat, or is it round? What about the ground outside? Oh, wait. What if you go to the shore of a lake or the ocean, and you look really, really far away? Does it go straight and flat forever? No. It curves around. It curves down. It is curved. Okay, it's so... It's such a long, long curve that we can't tell that it's curved. But I'm pretty sure the floor isn't really flat and straight. It's just locally flat. This is something physicists have to deal with. What you think might look straight, just because I drew it as straight as I could, it really doesn't have to be straight. That at a small enough distance, on a small enough scale, it doesn't matter whether it's curved or flat, and you can't tell. So that's the scale we're talking about. If, if theta is really, really small, and my time is really, really small, because I want instantaneous stuff. Yes, this is borderline calculus logic, but I have to have it here. And actually, with these triangles, and just shrink the side of that triangle down really small, you do one one-thousandth is small enough. You don't have to go to the extremes of calculus. Okay, that's small enough. Okay, I got it then. I know. You seem like I, I don't have it. I got the magnitude, at least, of change in V is just V times theta, this really small angle. Well, so I need delta T to divide it by. But how can I get the time? I actually just take the arc length, R theta, from my circle up there. Right, that's the distance around the curve between points 1 and 2 that I traveled. And divide by the speed, the constant speed that I traveled with. Okay? So then my acceleration, or at least its magnitude, must be magnitude of delta V over delta T, which we point out is V theta. Yeah, let's not bother. Make that red. Okay, and then I've got R theta, cool, over V. Hey, it didn't matter if I really, it didn't matter if I took that theta all the way down to zero. They canceled out anyway. I get to multiply and divide by it. Hmm. Okay. And it didn't matter if it was straight or arc. I could treat it either way. If I treat it correctly, it's going to cancel out. Now I got this stacked up fraction. Well, I need to multiply numerator and denominator by V to get this double denominator gone. You know you can do that, right? On a fraction, multiply by one, same number over same number. Oh, but look. That's V squared over R. is the magnitude of the acceleration. Okay. It gets even better if you drew carefully. I'll let you finish my little math. Okay. So it even comes out of the derivation. This is the instantaneous acceleration. If ever I measure something moving around a curve that could be approximated as a circle with a constant v, at least over short times, then I can tell it's accelerating at v squared over r just by geometry. And if it happens to speed up or slow down around the curve, well, I just make up a new curve that matches the regular speed. And it might even, in real life, it might even change the center. It changes its radius. All kinds of crazy stuff can change. But this geometry, I just did geometry. This is the space in our universe. It holds true because I can measure angles and draw straight lines and circles. Ouch. So this one has to be true, unless you can void circles. It's even better. Scroll up to your picture. What happens if we bring point 0.2, if we make theta really small, and we bring point 0.2 way back to point 0.1? This angle, this, this triangle here with the green and red sides shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and this arrow shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until it point, comes back and points straight down 
the radius back towards the center. So especially for very small angles and very short times, the acceleration is exactly towards the center. Okay, radially inward, and it has to equal v squared over r. Did your heads hurt yet? <laughs> I finally, finally it seems easy this year. Maybe there's other struggles I'm going through. Uh, but every year this used to give me fits to try to prove it. Okay, but I think it came out pretty well this year. I'll post the video. We got m minutes I can add to the video, so let's do an easy example. Okay, any questions? Anybody still need this? You just accept, just, you know, be humble and accept v squared over r. Here's something easy. Newton's law of gravitation is just this formula. Now, it's not a theory of gravitation. Isaac Newton just said, between any two masses in the universe, there is a force of attraction proportional to the product of their masses. He didn't even know this number, big G and inversely proportional to, to the square of the distance between, the distance between their centers, in fact, the center of mass. He did know center of mass. He kind of perfected that. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a scientific law, not a theory. What does that mean? Like a second law of thermodynamics. What's other law? Do you have any laws from chemistry? That's okay. Laws aren't that great to know, although we're, this one is on your equation sheet. Um, so you don't really need to memorize it. That's just what always happens. He just observed, oh, I can pick something up, and it's attracted to the Earth, or it always has this weight. There must be a force pulling them together. There must be. I, I observe it. You can observe it, too. That's all a law is. Okay? He managed to guess the equation right, except he didn't know this number. About a hundred years after Isaac Newton lived and died, they built giant spheres out of lead, and they built a really careful torsion balance, which is like a balance on a wire that can swing around, and they moved the spheres of lead around carefully and actually measured, okay, how much, how much is the gravity changing? It's because we moved like 2,000 pounds of lead, and like rolled around the room, really. That was the obnoxious experiment. All to get this number. But this is the same big G that we use in Einstein's equations today. It's, it's a well-established value, the gravitational constant of the universe. Whoops, and I covered it up with my record symbol. Okay, all it is is the constant where if you multiply two masses in kilograms and you divide by a distance squared between their centers, it tells you the force between them. It spits it out. And it's 10 to the negative 11th power times 6.67. So it's a really, really small constant. In fact, we're going to do an experiment with me and Mrs. Wickcomb. Okay, have you calculated already what's the gravitational force between us? The force of attraction. You just take 6.67, 10 to the minus 11th, we can wrestle your calculator tomorrow, times 100 kilos, times 50 kilos, divide by 1 squared. You certainly could use M1 and M2. Okay. As I'm about to show here, though, uh, big M needs to be some planet-sized object. Fifth Hour wanted to debate, is the moon a planet or not? Because you should actually get, I think, 3.34 times 10 to the negative seventh newtons. Less than a millionth of a newton. Good luck measuring that. Yep. Ah. So against two n or normal sized objects, like they had to measure super careful down to like microns, millions of a meter, <coughs> with this thing wiggling. And it was like two thousand pounds of lead. Because if you can't if you can't have giant masses, you really can't detect the force of gravity. It's the fact that the Earth is six times a trillion times a trillion again, Newtons. <coughs> So, aha, uh -huh. actually, you know, you can also calculate the acceleration due to the force of gravity, if that's your only force. And you divide off the small m. So you can also do big G times big M over r squared, your distance from its center. And if you use the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, you can get little g. That's part of the homework. Okay. 
But so unless you have at least a moon size object, you really don't need to deal with the force of gravity <coughs> or calculate its attraction. Tomorrow we'll talk about how that applies to satellites and moons and things and gravity on other planets. It's just plugging in either to this formula where you just have G and big M or plugging into the whole formula. Okay, it's really easy. And I give you the formula. You don't have to memorize it. Cool. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I suggest...